Welcome to Slash Forward. In this episode, we're going to go around and around while attempting to avoid getting our minds all wrapped up, but not in a circle. In a cube, you see, as we take a spirited jaunt through the 1997 film Cube. Imagine waking up in a strange room with doors on every wall. Unbeknownst to you, some of those doors lead to adjacent rooms that contain deadly traps. However, it's not random. They are identified by a complex number system. Sure, you wouldn't be able to figure it out, but would one of the other survivors you happen to stumble across along the way? Would you have the time and wherewithal to sort things out to determine everyone's special talents? And would those talents have anything to do with why each person was selected and placed inside the device? Man, I'm really not sure about that. But I am sure that, along the way, we're going to have a few laughs and just maybe learn a few lessons. Be sure to comment with your best idea for how to navigate this labyrinthine hellscape. And hit the like button if, in the process of pondering it, you learn something about yourself. Let's get to it. We open unsettlingly on the closest close-up of an eyeball that's possible with modern technology, pulling back to reveal that it belongs to a man. He has awoken inside an unfamiliar chamber. Naturally curious, he spins a lever and opens a door that leads to an adjacent compartment. Swelling with pride over this discovery, he does this several times, choosing to finally enter one of them for reasons unknown. Despite the similarities of each cube, he remains cautious. His reluctance was prescient, as his first and only step forward results in his body becoming conveniently cubed for efficient storage. We then cut to a couple more cubesters exploring rooms and trying to make the best choices they can. With limited information, they opt to group up and work together to avoid traps. Before long, they discover that they're in the party room where all roads converge. Apparently, momentarily safe, they gather their thoughts as Ren sacrifices future foot comfort for the sake of ruling out certain pathways. In comparing notes, they try to ascertain what the hell happened. They realize that they all blacked out at some point and then woke up here, with no further details available to them about where they are or why they're here. Quentin, a natural leader, helps Ren feel empowered by soliciting his advice on how to proceed. His intent is to head in a straight line to the end of the road, which he will do with relative safety due to the boot. Quentin, a cop on the outside, gives Levin a pep talk to get her squared away and ready as the group begins booting their way along. She finds some room numbers in a shaft and hopes they're not sequential as that would indicate a buttload of rooms, and they only have a few days to survive without water. To help alleviate this, Ren tells Holloway to suck a button, but in a helpful way. Then a room with noticeable ozone indicates the boot is not always truth. Molecular chemical sensor. Ah, and as we all know, boots have no molecules. Quentin then puts together that Ren is THE Ren, famous professional prison escapist. He's been in the paper. Anyway, he has the perfect skill set for this type of circumstance. His first jewel of advice? Shut the F up and focus on numero uno. If they all didn't have boots he could use, he would have already left them behind. It's a good thing he shared this wisdom because he then demonstrates the consequence of taking things too easy when he gets blasted in his face. And when they see him again, he is in extreme distress, as his head has been reformed into a little soup bowl that holds the bubbling, foamy remains of his face. But if this is his fate, the pro, what are the rest of them, they wonder? Then they also get caught up in trying to figure out the reason they were chosen for whatever this is. Levin and Worth claim to be a couple of boring normies, and Holloway the Doctor criticizes Worth for being a porn dog, while Quentin puzzles over why Levin the student was allowed to keep her glasses. And since there's no such thing as a coincidence, Levin is encouraged to put her academics to the test, and she quickly recognizes trap rooms are marked by prime numbers. She can confirm this because she remembers all the prior numbers from the rooms she's passed through. Yep, just a typical math student from the local university. The boot then confirms what the brain has derived, and Levin begins to find her voice. Now they progress quickly, carried through by her infallible numerology, making their way through, but to where? They eventually take a break for some casual chit-chat, at which point Quentin shares that he has three kids. Poor woman, there's no way I'd survive that. She didn't either. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. She's not dead. She, we're just separated. What, what is this conversation? Soon after, they hit the end of the road, a room with all adjacent prime numbers and only one door unchecked. Quentin climbs up to scope it out, but finds it already occupied by Kazan. His arrival now requires them to move a little bit more slowly to accommodate his anxiety and color preferences. As they move through, they ponder who the mastermind may be. Quentin suggests some sort of rich psychopath, but Holloway finds this laughable. But her hubris is quickly punished when she jumps down 
down and chokes on her button. Great, now she has to wait until it passes to suck it again. With each new room blending with the last, they get a bit too casual, and Quentin finds himself inside a razor wire contraption. He manages to dive out with only a partial leg shave, but they also recognize that they can no longer trust the prime number hypothesis. Quentin has a sneaking suspicion that Worth knew the trap was there, but he lets it go, and when they all regroup, they take a rest so Levin can try to work things out. Unfortunately, this experience has turned her from a meek church mouse into a boss little know-it-all who complains about everything, like when Kazan starts peeing inside their room. When Worth starts up again with his nihilism, Quentin has another go at him. He expresses his utter disdain and suggests that if nothing means anything, why didn't he just jump into a cube? Which of course he does not. Quentin riles him up enough to cause him to slip up and reveal that he has some knowledge of this place, although he contends that he was only contracted to design the outer candy shell. He knows nothing specific because they were all compartmentalized and worked on only one piece. This sounds a lot like governmental conspiracies, so Holloway gets jacked up at the thought of being correct in her assessment, but Worth suggests it was just a thing that came together with no grand purpose and no real intention, somehow, and that it's being used only to demonstrate that it's not pointless. Their presence is a manifestation of the out-of-control nature of humanity, or something. If it's any consolation at all, Worth does find catharsis in the admission and subsequent beating. Levin does at least get the outer dimension of the cube. After walking off their room, she figures the whole thing has got 26 cubes in any direction. 17,576 rooms. She then realizes that the numbers are Cartesian coordinates, but if that's true, she started in a room that should have been outside the cube, but at least they have a general idea of how far along they are, although there is still the ever-present danger of traps. Unwilling to backtrack after coming this far and working out that the next room is set off by noise, Quentin insists on traversing it with Worth taking the lead. They then begin the process of slowly and quietly descending into the blue box. Worth looks out and at the first room he checks passes the boot test, so they're all lowered in. Kazan puts it on hard mode as he comes down on the opposite side of the room, and then also doesn't watch his step very well. Luckily, they're able to turn the crank to release him. Quentin comes down last at the exact moment that the lower door makes its final turn on its own, but this doesn't set off the trap. However, when Kazan expresses his excitement, it does give Quentin the chance to look like a total badass for the second time. Now that he's all geared up, he and Holloway have it out over the differences between progressive ideals and authoritarianism, resulting in a complete loss of control that degrades his trustworthiness as a leader. Once that nasty business is wrapped up, Worth opens the next door to reveal the darkness of the outer shell. With nothing out there and nothing to hold on to, Quentin suggests they swing around in the dark to see if they can find a way down. Given the weight limit of their makeshift rope, Holloway volunteers to be the test subject. She only gets about one box down, and the rest of them aren't really able to hold her when she attempts to swing. What's more, when a nearby rumble shakes them, the gang loses their grip on the rope. Quentin manages to hold on, but when she reaches him, he gets that look in his eyes and lets her go, which is exacerbated by the sudden disappearance of the rope. Now down to the four of them, they agree to take a refreshing nap to recharge their batteries. But basically, as soon as they all hit REM sleep, he steals Levin to the next room and tries to convince her that they are the keys to getting out, and the others are traps. But his similes take on an uncomfortably sexual air. Then the others arrive, but they seem standoffish for some reason, and no matter how hard Quentin hits them, they don't warm up to him. Then he uses Worthless Worth as a trap tester, which is flippin' hilarious. After all that effort, they've managed to arrive back with the old Renster. Then and they all allow themselves at least a brief moment of coming unglued. But then Worth gets the idea to check the room that killed Ren and finds an empty void. This indicates that it's not them circling, but that the rumbling they've been hearing are the cubes themselves changing positions. It then dawns on Levin that she should have been using all the numbers, not just the first one. The additional digits indicate permutations of movement and cycles. When she remembers the cube that seemed to have the impossible coordinate, she posits that if they can get back to that cube, when it returns to its original position, they will be outside the cube at large. So Levin gets to computing in an attempt to solve the puzzle. After figuring their room, she asks for numbers from all the others to use as reference points. Based on this information, she identifies that there are two cycles left before they would be stuck waiting for the whole thing to start over again. In other good news, she now recognizes that trap rooms are identified not by prime numbers, but by numbers that are a power of a prime. The bad news is that she can't compute these astronomical numbers, but they discover that Kazan can. So at his request, Worth offers him all the gumdrops he can cram into his pie hole if he just gets them out of there. I don't like the red ones. 
That's not the point. They confirm the next room is safe, but not if it's the correct room, but they go in anyway. They begin moving quickly and Worth makes an attempt to free them of the hassle of Quentin's volatile paranoia by dropping him into a cube. Then they really get going until eventually, and apparently through pure luck, they find their original cube, indicating of course that if they had worked things out to begin with, they didn't have to move at all. They are waylaid when Kazan fails to cross over in time. His screams indicate that he's not far, so Worth goes to retrieve him as Levin confirms their location and reveals the next room should take them to the bridge. They all pile in and get yeeted into oblivion. After the final move, they transfer into what they presume to be the bridge. Sure enough, when they open the door, they are greeted by the blinding white light of heaven. But Worth isn't feeling so great. He's morose and decides that there's not really anything out there waiting for him to give his life meaning. This works out well as Quentin appears and shares his new philosophy that freedom is only for the strong, and he starts getting stabby. But after he drops his implement and attempts to leave, Worth catches him by the heel and holds on just long enough for the rooms to start back up again, converting Quentin into a humble wall smear. Then Worth lays down and dies, as Kazan wanders off in search of gumdrops. Cube is a very interesting and unique premise for a horror film, and I think they did a really good job of putting this together and making it look so good despite the small budget. The acting was a bit stage theater at times, but I think the primary shortfalls of the movie arose from the attempt to cram so much story into the standard time frame. It required them to move along at a fairly high pace and left a lot of questions in my mind. I enjoyed the idea that they don't know why they're in the cube or who is responsible for it. I don't think that needs to be explained. But then, in that vein, they probably didn't need to spend as much time talking about it. It would have been better to use that time to explain or show the characters setting some establishing rules to help bring the movie together. For instance, they seem to move in and out of rooms fairly directly. They didn't check every door each time or really discuss what direction they were going or why. If they set that up at the beginning so we know it's part of their method, it would need to be shown each time and it would demonstrate that their progression is not sheer luck. Also, in regards to the movement, it was interesting to have different methodologies for identifying safe and unsafe rooms. However, the way they went about revealing those changes made it seem like the success they had experienced from their prior methods was also basically the result of sheer luck. If you know the numbers mean something, why not spend more time sorting out what they mean? Also, if they're meaningful, why would you ever assume that only one of the three numbers is useful? If you're wrong about how the trap rooms are identified, how the hell did you make it so far without finding that out the hard way? Maybe it has something to do with the relationship between prime numbers and factors of prime numbers that they essentially work the same. But but I'm not mathematically illiterate enough to be able to confirm that, and they didn't make it seem like that was the case. In addition, it seemed odd, given the limited time that they had, that they weren't proceeding under a general principle to guide them in streamlined decision making. Ren indicated he was going in a straight line to the end, but after what they sorted out later about the size and quantity of the cubes, it seemed like it would have made sense to adopt a rule like go down every time you have the opportunity to go down. We do learn that this wouldn't have gotten them out, but they didn't know that until much later. The mere presence the presence of downward doors indicates that you're some distance up, so why would you assume that when you reach the edge, you won't be so high that you can't get down? Aside from that, the only other real criticism I would have comes from the weird continuity errors they introduced into the film. There are characters who should have seen each other at certain times but didn't, or Quentin showing up out of nowhere at the end. How did he find them, let alone enter the room without being noticed? There are a few things like this throughout, but I think these are minor gaffes overall, because the way the story is presented is interesting enough that some of these elements, likely added for stylistic or dramatic purposes, are easily ignored. Now that we're here, I want to congratulate you for making it to the end of the video, and affirm that you are a very special person because of it. Before we go, I'd like to give a huge thanks to my donors, Memorial in the Hall of Headshots. I have a website set up where you can support the channel through donations or merch. Any donation unlocks a growing collection of uncensored movie recaps. And if you enjoyed the video, I would love for you to become part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.